And I'm really pleased to, to welcome the community and alumni to the second in our public speaker series that is um, the start of our celebration of our 60th anniversary. The biological sciences was one of the founding campus departments on this campus, which is a really uh, brand new campus that has had this amazing trajectory and amazing impact on the community. And we're really proud of that, and we're proud of the accomplishments of our alumni and our faculty and our students and trainees. And so um, as dean, I have the great privilege of learning every day about the great science that's going on in the Division of Biological Sciences. And so I wanted to make sure that we were um, inviting the public back to the campus to hear about what we're doing and that we were sharing our discoveries with the public and with the campus community. As a public university, it really is our job to be a part of our community and to reach out to the community and to thank the community for supporting us and to share with you what we're doing here at, on campus. Um, we take our job here very seriously and really want to make sure that we're an engine of um, economic and social mobility and of discovery in our community and so that we provide a great environment for research, education, and service to our community. So I'm really pleased. I know you're going to love the talks today. We're um, taking, the this series is entitled A Deep Look into the Future of Biology, and I have four fabulous speakers here today that will tell you a little bit about what's, what they're doing, and it'll give you a flavor of our exciting research. This, the, tonight's uh, series is focused on uh, genetics and society and the ethics of using some of these cutting-edge new genetic technologies that are being developed on campus. So I think you'll have a lot of fun. And I'd like to thank our partners in hosting this event, and specifically the graduate division and the alumni office are helping us to get this whole event together, and I'm really pleased for their partnership and grateful to them. Okay. So um, there will be questions after each speaker, and so if you have a question after the speaker, please raise your hand, and one of the team members will get you a microphone to ask the question. And then after all four speakers, we'll have a brief panel discussion. Um, really, ask, I'll ask them to speculate a little bit about what the future looks like in their field and what they're excited about there. Okay. So for the first speaker today, I'd like to... Um, I'm really pleased to uh, introduce Professor Stephen Briggs. Steve is a distinguished professor in cell and developmental biology, and he is a really unique asset in the division. He has um, a clear passion and ability in leadership, and he is a, a really creative scientist, as you'll see. And he has ample industry experience, because after um, receiving his PhD from Michigan State University, he then went to work in industry for a number of years before coming to UC San Diego as a faculty member. And we're really pleased to have Steve here as a member of the faculty. His research is outstanding and his teaching is fabulous. And he has um, really played a number of key leadership roles on campus throughout the years. So he's a really fabulous community member. He's also um, received many awards among them. Um, the, he's a member of the National Academy of Sciences and a member of the National Academy of Inventors and of the a AAAS Fellow. So please join me in welcoming Steve Briggs. Thanks, Kit, for the very kind introduction. Is the mic working okay? So uh, every good talk begins with mules. So let's uh, take a look. <clears throat> These are 20 mule borax wagon team. This is how the West was won. The mule, you can hear the jingling of their bells. The, the mule is a hybrid between the horse and the donkey. And mules have been made by people and used to move heavy loads long distances for more than 4,000 years. The mule has hybrid vigor, which includes qualities described by Charles Darwin in this quote from his children's book. The mule always appears to me a most surprising animal, that the offspring of the horse and the ass should possess more reason, memory, 
obstinacy, social affection, powers of muscular endurance, and length of life than either of its parents seems to indicate that art has here outdone nature. And the art he's referring to is the art of the animal breeder in making the mule. Our research is on maize, which is easier to study than mules. All animals, plants, humans show hybrid vigor. Most of our crops and livestock are now produced as hybrids because of their increased vigor. The parents of this maize hybrid shown on either side of the plant in the middle, which is the hybrid, they're much smaller and they produce much less grain. Obviously, the hybrid is accumulating much more photosynthate, uh, uh, even though the, uh, an increase in photosynthesis has never been directly observed in, in these plant hybrids. In a natural population, the two copies of a chromosome shown down below there to the left uh, are partially different. And this is for every chromosome in an individual. They're all in pairs and they're partially different in most individuals. We now know that inbreeding, and you've probably heard of inbreeding in human families like royal families. Inbreeding causes genetic uniformity shown by the uniform colors of the chromosomes on the inbred, which is small in the middle. And we don't know anything about how that inbreeding causes this, uh, this inbreeding depression. But mating those two inbred individuals to create a hybrid releases this superpower of hybrid vigor and results in a, an individual stronger, bigger, uh, more healthy than even the natural population from which it came. This yin and yang of inbreeding depression on one hand, hybrid vigor on the other, is a natural phenomenon universal across plants and animals with no scientific explanation. Modern genomics research has been directed towards finding one or more locations on the chromosomes, like those blue regions or white regions, that are necessary for hybrid vigor without success. Likewise, efforts to find genomic changes, like changes in gene expression or mRNA levels, have not been fruitful. So as a result, what's observed is mRNA ex expression is average in hybrids. Typically, uh, in, in most cases, most genes, the mRNA levels in the two parents are the same and, and the same with the hybrid. But in some cases, as shown here, a particular gene may be expressed more in one parent than the other. But in nearly every case, the hybrid shown in the middle has the average of the two parents. So it, there doesn't seem to be anything that could express the extraordinary biology of the hybrid based on gene expression. Scientists have predicted that, that the hybrid would express its genes, or some of them, higher than, than both parents. But that simply hasn't been observed. Now we've recently developed protein measurement capabilities that can detect the difference between proteins or their peptides of, of just one electron and one atom between them. And that gives us a highly sensitive method where we can pool multiple samples and get the power of, of uh, statistics we need to make precise measurements. And having done that, we found that protein, in contrast to gene expression as RNA, is very selectively above average in the hybrids. About 1% of the proteins are expressed above average levels. Uh, you can see the green arrow there showing that. Now these particular proteins, they were already known to be special. They come together to form large protein machines that transduce energy in the cells into chemical energy. And that chemical energy powers almost all of the processes inside cells. And the chloroplasts shown in green there, is where photosynthesis takes place, these machines 
convert the light energy into chemical energy. And the mitochondrion, which is, is also the energy machine of animals, shown in red, the, the protein uh, machines in the mitochondrion also are expressed at above average levels. These proteins are special for another reason in that the machines they form are, are, are themselves hybrids. They're a hybrid of proteins from the nuclear genome, where the proteins are imported into the chloroplast and mitochondrion, and from the uh, uh, genomes of the chloroplast and the mitochondrion. So we call these digenomic uh, protein machines or protein complexes. So <clears throat> the other digenomic protein machines besides the energy uh, transduction machines are the machines for protein synthesis called the ribosome. These ribosomes also are expressed above average. And it's not surprising uh, that they're elevated because the energy transduction machines, these proteins, are some of the most abundant. And so it's, it's expected you need to, more ribosomes in order to make more of those machines. Now, you're probably asking yourself, how does increasing protein levels above average, as shown in the lower uh, graph there with the green arrow, how does that make the plant bigger since that's still less than the parent number two shown on the right? Shouldn't that parent be bigger than the hybrid? And the answer to that is in a phenomenon called complementation. And this is really the key to hybrid vigor. If you think of photosynthesis, which is shown uh, in this depiction of the chloroplast, has two processes of photosynthesis, the light-dependent processes on the right, and then the carbon processes, uh, I mean, on the left, and the carbon processes on the right. It's like two sections of pipe joined together. If one of those sections is small, then the flow of chemical energy through the pipe is going to be small. The hybrid gets a large section for the first uh, part from one parent, and for the second part of the pipe from the other parent, so it has two large sections, and that's why the hybrid is able to have a greater growth in chemical energy, because its entire photosynthetic process is elevated. So in summary, maize hybrids selectively overexpress their energy transducing and protein manufacturing machines, which together comprise several hundred proteins. They do this in a selective and coordinated manner that, um, that works by some unknown mechanism that does not involve changes in gene expression. Finally, I want to acknowledge uh, this is work done by a small team, two graduate students, Devin and uh, Laura. Laura's already graduated and move on. And my longtime partner in crime, Joe Shin Shen, who does all of the mass spectrometry in the lab. Also a collaborator, uh, Nathan Springer, the University of Minnesota and his postdoc, Peng Ju, and then Eric and Bridget, who have done very important work on this that I didn't have time to talk about. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Steve. So we will now take questions from the audience. And um, if you have a question, please raise your hand, and I will launch the questions um, by asking Steve. You spent a lot of time in industry. And I'm wondering if you could talk about the importance of academic training and basic research in industry. Yeah, so uh, training is very important. And I recall uh, running uh, research for two companies here in San Diego. And in both of them, we always looked for UC San Diego graduates, because invariably they were terrific. They could walk in, do the job, uh, the ethics were great, well trained. <coughs> And we really based a lot on where they got their training because it was a reliable indicator of their performance. Part of that is students at UCSD get a chance to do research. I think over half of our students work in a research lab. They don't just take courses. And so when they graduate, uh, working in a sort of an industrial capacity is not new to them. They've already got that, that experience, that training with intellectual property, as well as all the technical aspects. So it's very important. That's great. Thank you. 
There's a question. And if you've just come in, there are lots of seats up here in the front and also in the middle. So please feel free to come and join us. Does hybrid vigor always happen regardless of which parental strains there are? Or does it depend on the strains of the parents? That's a great question. Uh, it does depend on the strains of the parents. There are some sort of general guidelines that the more genetically distant they are, the more hybrid vigor you'll get. But it's not strictly true. There's even phenomenon uh, that give you the opposite of vigor that, that are deleterious when they're brought together for very specific reasons not related to hybrid vigor. Would you have predicted your results? No, no. So really, since 1876, when Darwin defined this as a scientific problem, people have been predicting what is hybrid vigor because it's the foundation of our food supply, and it's also very important in nature. And it's been kind of wonderful for biologists because we could all speculate about it without ever being wrong because no, nobody could crack it experimentally. Um, in retrospect, the, the energy machines are lying at the core of this seems obvious, but efforts to find that uh, failed. So I think we were all looking for something completely unexpected, and I guess the obvious sometimes is expected. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you, Steve. Okay, so our next speaker is Hannah Grunwald, who's a PhD student in Kim Cooper's lab. And Hannah is really interested in how, in the evolution of form in mammals, and specifically in how limbs evolve their varied shapes and functions in animals, which is a really fascinating topic. She was uh, the first to use CRISPR-based gene editing technology in mice, and so she'll tell you about that technology, or one of the, among the first. There we go. Gene drive. Sorry. She will correct me. This is a student's role and faculty's role is to keep the dean honest. Okay. Um, this technology will have many future uses and applications in biomedical research, and that we expect this to have a huge impact in the future. Before coming to UC San Diego, she, was, she received her bachelor's from Swarthmore College in Pennsylvania, and we're really pleased to have her as a member of our graduate school student population. She's a fabulous student, as you'll hear, and a great communicator. So please join me in welcoming Hannah. Hi. Is this on? Can people hear me? Oh, fabulous. Thank you so much, Kit. It is an enormous, enormous pleasure to be speaking to you today. Thank you all so much for coming out. Um, and thank you, Kit, for <laughs> inviting me to share some of my research. I was not the first to use CRISPR editing in mice, but we are the first to ever use a gene drive-like mechanism in mice, which I'm going to tell you about today. Um, as you can see from this picture, I clearly own only the one shirt. <laughs> um, OK. All right. Um, I'm going to tell you today about mammals. Just in general, I find animal forms fascinating. I don't know how many of you have a pass to the fabulous San Diego Zoo, but I spend a lot of time there. And even if you look at just a small subset of animals, the mammals for instance, you can see that there are dramatically different shapes and sizes and forms that they have. And this is really interesting because their underlying structure is almost exactly the same. They all have the same skeletal features, and they all have very similar genes in their genomes. So up here, the mammal that I'm married to and the girl that he's trying to kiss have very different features, but very similar genomes and also very similar underlying structures. And even if you just look at one particular part of a mammal, for instance, the limb, I hope you can appreciate that those changes are really dramatic. And while I think that cool shapes are cool, this also has a big underlying impact because form informs function. And the shape that you take changes the kinds of behaviors that you can engage in, which change the kind of ecological niches that you can fill, right? So for example, there is this lovely field mouse here at the top who's able to navigate his environment. 
And that's partially because of those incredible paws that are very flexible and can grab onto these stalks that he's walking across. The animal that we study in my lab moves a little bit differently. This is the lesser Egyptian jerboa. I hope you can appreciate that its movement is very different and is kind of a function of those, well, is a function of those long, skinny legs. So that even though the jerboa is very closely related to the mouse, it actually moves much more similarly to a horse. Some people ask why the jerboa needs to move in this way, and they would be right to ask that, and I will continue clicking. Ah, here it is. Now, it turns out that in the open desert, predators abound. <laughs> Being able to hop all over the place in a super unpredictable manner completely changes whether or not you can avoid predators. These animals live in these big dune-covered deserts where the hawks circle. They don't have anywhere to hide, so they have to move fast, and they have to move erratically. First try. So ultimately what we have here is this incredible animal that has these very different legs, but is very closely related to the mouse. It's about 55 million years divergent from the mouse. To give you perspective, bats, which we think of as flying mice, are actually more closely related to dolphins than they are to mice. Draboas and mice are sister groups. They're very similar to one another. And that allows us to ask two big questions. One is, what changes can you make in a genome that's relatively similar that still causes really big changes in the shape of the animal. And the other question is how do we make limbs in general? Comparing these two very different limbs allows us to determine some of the features that tell the thigh to be a certain length compared to the feet, right? And that's completely relevant to all of us because many of you in the audience have limbs. <laughs> now, the jerboa is a very cool organism, but unfortunately, it is not a model organism. It hasn't been very well studied. And that means that I don't have any genetic tools that I can use in the jerboa in order to study it. But we can use its sister, the mouse. And I can modify mice to carry jerboa DNA and make a mouse that has a phenotype or characteristic that's very similar to a jerboa. So I thought to myself, what gene shall I put from a jerboa into a mouse? And, went, and I looked at what genes are important in making those incredible feet. And this is a list of the first like seven of a list of 1,500, right? There are tons of genes that are incredibly important for this trait, which is fine, except that it is very difficult to make mouse models of complex traits it's hard to fold a whole bunch of different genes together into one mouse. And that's because of genetics. This is really important for me because I love these feet, but it's also important in many aspects of mouse biology. Many people use mice to study disease, and many human diseases are multigenic. They have many genes that cause them, which means that it's very difficult to build a mouse model that has all of those genes that are important. So we have been working on a way to bring many genes together at once into one fantastic mouse model that really mimics, in our case, the jerboa. Just want to give you some lessons in mouse biology briefly. Let's imagine that a trait is controlled by three genes, and I cross two carriers together. They each have a copy of those three genes, but they don't have the trait because they don't have two copies together. I would need almost 150 offspring to just have a chance of finding one that actually has that trait. And that's too many mice. Normally, when you cross two mice together, they inherit one chromosome from each parent. So here we have a mouse that's inherited that chromosome that has the gray allele of the gene and the black allele of the gene. And the dominant one is going to be the one that's actually expressed, right? So here we have a black mouse, even though it has a copy of each allele. But if we had a gene drive gene that was inherited that could copy itself to the opposite chromosome, then suddenly this mouse would actually have two copies of the gray allele and be gray, right? That's the entire concept behind this. And then we're going to get into the sticky details because I think they're fun, OK? The idea behind this is you make a chromosome that carries two pieces. It's got a cutting enzyme 
which is called Cas9, and it has a guide RNA. The guide RNA guides the Cas9 to the opposite chromosome, and the Cas9 goes ahead and makes a cut there. DNA does not like to be cut, and so all of your cells have machinery inside of them that are made to correct those mistakes, to fuse those cuts back together. So one possible way this can happen is by the end sort of just being jammed together, but sometimes that leaves a mistake, a mutation. Another way this can happen is by these ends lining up with one another, because they're homologous, they're similar, and copying information across. And that's how we can get this copying gene to work. And this was first shown to, to be possible um, in flies and then in mosquitoes by researchers here at UCSD, Valentino Beer and um, Valentino Gans and Ethan Beer. Um, sorry, I, I like know them both really well. That was embarrassing. Um, all right, so it had never been shown ever in a vertebrate. And we tested combinations of seven different genes over the course of two years and found only one combination that actually allowed us to copy information from one chromosome to another. However, we did find that one combination that allowed us to copy. And we think that this is going to help a lot because with our rates of copying, rather than needing 150 offspring for that chance of one, we would need only 50. And that's a huge improvement. I think that this could help me build my Gerbaus, but I want to remind you that it's also really essential for anyone who's building mouse models of anything complicated, anything that's involving more than one gene. So finally, I'd like to take the opportunity to thank, again, the organizers of this for inviting me, um, and my incredible, incredible mentor, Kim Cooper, who's a brilliant scientist and also just an incredible person, as well as my entire lab, and the several undergrads who have helped me, one of them is here in the audience. Um, thank you all, and I would love to take your questions. Thank you, that was great. Um, so I would like to ask, what's been the most rewarding, rewarding thing about being a graduate student here? So I'm really excited to answer this question. I picked it out for her. Um, <laughs> so I, I legitimately have loved grad school in general. It's an opportunity where you're in a safe environment and you can study all sorts of exciting things and you don't have to be the one in charge of getting funding, so you just feel free as a bird. Um, but the best thing for me has actually been something that didn't totally come from the science side. Because I got involved with this project, I got involved with a whole bunch of different groups that are investigating ethics of these projects and the societal implications of these projects. So we're going to hear from John later, but I've had the opportunity to actually spend some time with John, to go to India and to talk with a whole bunch of scientists and also philosophers and ethicists to go to North Carolina and speak with people who are working to make sure that invasive rodent species don't take over islands and completely destroy biodiversity. I really have had this truly special opportunity to see my work in a bigger context, and that's been the most rewarding part for me. That's great. Thank you. Are there questions from the audience in the back? Thanks for a great talk. Um, so speaking of ethics and sort of societal impacts. Do you build in uh, sort of kill switches, or are you worried at all about runaway gene drives? Because if one of those mines gets away. So this is a really good question. The copying gene that I showed you could copy itself, and there are ways of stopping it, right? But it could theoretically copy itself forever. I was a little misleading in showing you that. The way that we do it is to actually encode the Cas9 on one chromosome and the guide RNA on another chromosome so that by the second generation, they actually have split up and that gene will no longer copy itself. So it's an automatic kill switch. It only will last for one generation. That's great. Thank you. Are there other questions from the audience? Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> Our next speaker is Omar Akbari. Omar is... Um, one of our faculty whose research is, has the potential to have both global and local impact as he's developing uh, technologies to um, prevent mosquito-borne transmission of a variety of human diseases and also to control agricultural pests. Um, he's a member of the Tata Institute for Genetics and Society, which is part of this larger effort that 
Hannah mentioned, um, to control mosquito-borne disease and improve agriculture. And we work side by side with the Institute for Practical Ethics that you'll hear about later. Um, Omar received his bachelor's degree and his PhD from the University of Nevada. And he came to UCSD in 2017. And we're really pleased to have him as a member of, of the Division of Biological Sciences. He, he's also a member of the Tata Institute for Genetics and Society. And in 2018, he co-founded a company um, that is a really great thing to do. So anyway, I'm really pleased to, uh, to introduce Omar, and please join me in welcoming him to the stage. All right. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Kit, for the very kind introduction. And I'm also really happy and, and humbled to be here with, and thankful for the opportunity to present on some of the work that we're developing in our lab. Um, and today, I'm going to talk to you about a few different genetic technologies we're developing in our lab um, that, has, that have the potential at, to bite back at mosquitoes. All right, so just to begin, mosquitoes are considered to be the world's deadliest animals. And the reason they're so deadly is because they kill more people than any other animal combined on Earth. The next closest thing is humans killing each other. <laughs> and the reason they're so deadly is because they transmit so many different pathogens that can affect human health, um, from malaria to dengue to West Nile to Zika virus. It's estimated that one half of the world's population is presently at risk of being infected by a mosquito-borne pathogen. If we just look at malaria alone, um, we have about over 200 million infections per year and about half a million people dying every single year. And those are mostly people in sub-Saharan Africa, um, oftentimes children under the age of five. If, if, you, um, if you calculate it out, it's, it's, it's um, about a child dying every two minutes. So since I started my talk, a child died. So it's, it's a pretty um, serious problem that we need to solve. Dengue fever is also pretty serious. Um, it has uh, quite a lot of infections, uh, uh, almost 400 million infections per year. We have less deaths, about 50,000 deaths, but we have a lot of suffering. So how do we protect ourselves from mosquitoes? Um, our first line of defense is simply to re reduce, uh, reduce contact. And we can do that by using repellents, bed nets, lures and traps. We can modify the environment. We understand that mosquitoes lay their eggs in standing water. So if we can remove the occurrence of standing water um, in our yards, we can prevent population density in that way. We can use insecticides and larvicides, things that can kill adult mosquitoes or prevent the larvae from maturing into adults. We can use pathogen removal drugs like artemisin, which is used throughout Africa to, um, to prevent the uh, parasite from developing in humans. And then there's also some newer genetic technologies that are being used in the field today. Now, the point I want to make is that while all of these different approaches are essential for any sort of sustained control of mosquitoes, they all have problems. So repellents, bed nets, lures, and traps, these require a continuous application. They need to be distributed to the people that need them. Um, modifying the environment, you can imagine an environment that looks something like this. It would be not practical to go out and modify that. There would be drastic ecological implications. Um, insecticides and larvicides, these things are expensive. They're short-term solutions. Um, Mosquito populations bounce right back after the application's over. And the biggest problem is that um, mosquitoes have evolved resistance to many of these insecticides, so they're not effective anymore. Pathogen removal drugs, um, again, the parasite has evolved resistance to many of these, and so they're not 100% effective. And then the genetic technologies that are actually being used in the field today are not sustainable. So what we need urgently are new technologies that can try to solve this problem. I want to point out that um, I want to point out what the pathogen transmission cycle is. So the way this works is you have a wild mosquito that's going to bite an infected individual. It's going to take on the pathogen. It's going to incubate it for a period of time. And then it's going to transmit it to the next unlucky individual. So the real question is, how do we block this very simple chain of transmission from mosquito to human to mosquito to human? And the holy grail is to develop effective vaccines. If we can vaccinate everybody for malaria, for dengue, for Zika, et cetera, then we could potentially solve all these problems. Um, and the truth is there's, there's been 
tons of research poured into developing vaccines, but many, for many of these vectored pathogens, there, doesn't, there isn't effective vaccines today. So an alternative approach is simply to engineer pathogen-resistant mosquitoes, and that's what our lab works on. And either one of these two approaches can block this very simple chain of transmission, okay? So we, we have been working to engineer mosquitoes that are unable to transmit these pathogens. And here are two pieces of work from our lab, um, one in which we engineered mosquitoes to be unable to transmit Zika virus, and another in which we engineered mosquitoes to be unable to transmit dengue virus. There's also been work by other groups around the world that have engineered mosquitoes to be unable to transmit the plasmodium parasite. Um, and so the point I want to make here is that, that we do have this ability to completely harness the mosquito immune system and engineer mosquitoes that cannot transmit pathogens. So if we can engineer these pathogen-resistant mosquitoes, why don't we just go simply replace the wild mosquitoes with these engineered mosquitoes that cannot transmit these pathogens? And the hypothesis is that if we have less transmission by mosquitoes because they have these, these genes we engineered in them, then that should equate to less human disease. So I think of this kind of, um, uh, this problem kind of like this, where you engineer your disease-resistant mosquitoes, you mass rear them in a factory, and then you simply release them into wild disease-transmitting populations. And what you want to happen is you want those mosquitoes to transmit those genes for pathogen resistance into these wild populations rather quickly. And the goal would be that in some point in time, every single individual will carry these genes and be unable to transmit these pathogens, okay? Well, the grand challenge is how do you, how do you force a pathogen-resistant gene into a wild disease-transmitting population? And the underlying problem is a problem in genetics. Now, these genes that we put into mosquitoes are going to reduce the fitness of those mosquitoes. They're not gonna, they're, they're not gonna live as long. They're not gonna, they're not gonna mate as efficiently. Um, they're, they're reared in a laboratory. How are they gonna compete with these wild disease transmitting mosquitoes? They're probably not. Well, one solution to this problem is simply to link these genes for pathogen resistance with a gene drive system. And we just heard about the gene drive system that Hannah talked about in mice. Well, we've engineered uh, gene drives in mosquitoes and still have others. And just to remind you on how the inheritance pattern of a, of a gene drive, um, if we have a dominant, this is a normal inheritance, so if you have a dominant uh, trait and you have a 50% chance of inheriting it each generation, and after a few generations, it gets diluted out. And that's assuming no fitness cost. With a gene drive, that completely changes the game. So a gene drive will force the inheritance each generation up to 100%. And you can see that it will quickly force your gene into the population. So it can be used as a tool to spread these genes for pathogen resistance into these wild populations. So the take home message from this talk is that we, we, can, we can completely harness the mosquito immune system. And if we can link, we can engineer these genes in the mosquito, if we can link them with gene drives, then these someday can be used in the field to potentially save millions of lives and prevent worldwide suffering. Thank you. Thank you, that was great. Can you tell me what you find the most rewarding about the work that you do? Um, yeah, that's a great question. So um, the thing I find the most rewarding about the work we do is that I, f I feel that um, this problem that we're working on in terms of trying to develop solutions for mosquitoes is actually, um, it's a solvable problem where we can actually, I, I think if we can get these mosquitoes into the field, either these gene drive mosquitoes or we're also working on some other technologies of, of sterilizing mosquitoes, I think we could actually deploy these and, and th these will work. And I think we could save lives and, and that's what makes me most excited and passionate about the work we do because I think we can actually translate it. That's yeah. great, thank you. Are there other questions from the audience yet? Hi, um, fascinating talks. Um, the gene drive seems like a form of changing dominance in terms of the genes or at least forcing what might be a recessive um, 
attribute. If you force that, you're kind of it's kind of anti-Darwinian in a way, because you're in this case in particular, you're giving a weaker, you know, a weaker um, end result to win. I'm just wondering if there's a got you somewhere. You know, if Darwin's going to turn around and get you. <laughs> right. Um, that's an excellent question. And I think that's something we think about all the time in the lab. And some of the issues with gene drive right now are the evolution of resistance. So that's how Darwin gets you back. It evolved, the mosquitoes will evolve resistance to the mechanism of gene drive. And when that happens, those mosquitoes are not going to have this fitness deficit. And they will take over. So. The real, the real thing that people are focused on now is how do you make gene drives as effective as possible to reduce the, the, this effect? And, um, and the hope is that you, you, you probably will never be able to defeat Darwin or evolution, right? But if, you can, if your gene drive can be um, effective enough, then potentially it can sustain itself for a long enough period to block the disease transmission cycle. And, and I think that's what um, the hope will be. But I don't think you can ever engineer a perfect system that is, is going to defeat evolution. I, I, don't, I don't think that's possible. Yeah. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah, well, there's one here, too. Okay. Um, hi. Uh, thanks for the talk. Um, I would just have a few questions. Um, what exactly, or can you elaborate on um, how, uh, when you alter the, the genome of the mosquitoes, how that makes them less fit? Um, have you, like, maybe attempted to like find a mutation that would make them you know resistant to malaria but also make them f more fit um, compared to the wild type mosquitoes right um, that's a great question and it's it's really a just our hypothesis in that we believe that anything you anything you do to the mosquito any modification you make is is likely to reduce the fitness but um, you know for these gene drives for example you're you're putting in you know cas9 guide rnas that are expressed in the germline. You're also putting in marker genes that are ex expressed in, in, at a very high level. And so just the expression of these nucleases and, and, and these markers is, is likely to impose a fitness cost. And, and we've done comparisons in the lab to test the fitness of our animals, and they, they are reduced. But fitness is something that's actually really difficult to measure because you know, there's so many different aspects of it. You know, um, you know, you can, you can look at how long they survive for, how many eggs they lay, you know, there's just so many different things that, that can contribute to fitness. Um, we try to measure the, the, important, um, the important measures, but, but ultimately, I think it's quite hard to calculate. And the best measure is simply just to release them into a population and see if they can um, sort of invade that population and take over. Um, yeah, it's a good question. Another question here. Are you concerned about uh, unintended mutations that may occur either uh, in the lab that weren't detected or in the field after uh, uh, the uh, new genes are released? Yeah. Um, I mean, we're so we are concerned about. Um, having the gene drive be effective enough to, to, to function in the wild population. And so any mutation that is going to disrupt the function of the drive by mutating its target site, or maybe there's a natural variant that's already present in the wild population that will prevent the, um, the spread, would be a problem. So we are concerned about those things. And you know, one way to assess for that would be to, before you do a release, you actually go out and you collect mosquitoes from that population you sequence them and you determine whether or not there are natural variations at that site. But then after you do a release and during, you need to monitor for the evolution of resistance, which, which is likely to happen. So I think those are, those are the kinds of mutations that will sort of prevent the function of the gene drive from spreading. Um, I think those are things we are definitely concerned about, yeah. Okay, one more. There's a question here. Um, I guess this is getting a bit into the bioethics of it, but I'm curious if you've thought about the actual feasibility of doing this since you're um, releasing technology. Like the end goal is, you know, to spread this throughout the world. 
um, and that is releasing scientific technology that is going to cross um, various borders between countries and it's not like you can really isolate that within one country that get, you get approval from. So how, how would you do that logistically? So that's a really great question and, and we constantly think about the ethics of, of gene drive and our lab has been instrumental in, in developing gene drives like Hannah talked about that, that are self-limiting. They, they can't autonomously spread. And so I, I think, I think the, um, the types of gene drives, like the kind I showed in that, that, the, the last image where it can autonomous, autonomously spread on its own, I think those are going to be, uh, in my opinion, more difficult to, to get um, regulatory approval or public acceptance for because they spread and, and they, they can spread uncontrollably, right? Whereas these, these, these gene drives that are self-limiting, where they're split, split design or under dominance or things like that, they're more controllable. They're, they're, they're confined to the release site. They're unlikely to spread beyond. But I, I'm not even sure even those will be acceptable. So I, it, it, nobody has released a gene drive yet. There's been a lot of pushback against gene drive in terms of doing wild releases. So that actually, that actually changed the thinking of our lab. And, and so we, in addition to developing these self-limiting gene drives, we also develop a system that basically just is it's like a sterile insect. You know? And, and we, we, we're actually really pushing that forward strongly because we believe that is something that is, is very safe, effective, controllable. It meets all the criteria that people want right now. Um, while we develop gene drives too, and, and I think of it as sort of a stepwise approach where you, you, you go in with your first phase would be like an SIT type system. You build the infrastructure, you suppress populations, and then potentially you come in with a self-limiting type gene drive system, if that's acceptable. And if, if, if nothing goes wrong, right, everything goes as planned, and the community is ready and the public is ready, you know, uh, building a full gene drive from a split gene drive is trivial. Right. It's, it's simply moving one enzyme over, you know, one cloning step. So it's not, I, I, don't, I don't know the answer to this question, but I think in general we, we think about it a lot and it's, it's actually um, changing the way we do our research. So, yeah. That's great, thank you. Mm -hmm. That was great. So join me in thanking Omar. <laughs> yeah. So our last speaker for the evening is John Evans, who's a professor of sociology. John, is a, John specializes in considering, um, considering scientific and religious uh, debates and uh, studying them and learning how to influence them. And he's been really instrumental in the Tata Institute for Genetics and Society, working side by side with our researchers to ensure that we are considering the ethical and societal implications of the technology we're developing so that we can hope to release it. The great promise of the genetic technology that you heard here, have heard about so far tonight is that it will be able to cure disease and feed a growing population. And we will surely need this as we face the pressures of climate change and, and population growth and habitat destruction. And so we really need to make sure we're doing this in a wise and thoughtful manner. And so when we founded the Institute, our, uh, the Tata Institute for Genetics and Society, we partnered with the Institute for Practical Ethics, where John is a member, so that we could work side by side with philosophers, sociologists, and political scientists to be careful about what we're doing. And John is the co-director of the Institute for Practical Ethics, and he received his uh, bachelor's degree from McAllister College and his PhD from Princeton University. And he is not only a professor of sociology, he's also the associate dean of social sciences, the co-director of the Institute uh, for Practical Ethics, and he's the holder of the Tata Chair in Social Sciences. So he's really an integral member of our campus and our research effort, and he's a leader on the campus. So I'm really grateful for his participation tonight and looking forward to his talk. Join me in welcoming John. I'm going to give that very generous uh, introduction. I know the people who are alumni are wondering, what is this thing 
that's in the middle of these buildings now. Uh, this is a beacon right outside the hall here, and it's a piece of public art. But at the top is a light that's flashing, signaling in Morse code the first words transmitted by Samuel Morse in 1844 when he invented the telegraph. And it's saying, what hath God wrought? So in contemporary English, what has God done? What Morse was saying here was a very particular mid-19th century mixture of Protestant Christianity and science. And it's not some sort of warning. It's a statement of celebration. At the time, people would say, God is allowing us to use our brains to have these incredible innovations to reduce human suffering and to improve the human condition. It's a very mid-19th century mix of technological utopianism and religion. But by the, 100 years later, if people were going to invoke divine will in such matters, it would typically be non-religious people saying we shouldn't play God with technology X or Y, particularly having to do with genetics. So these two images embody the tension that's always existed with science and technology. If we can translate this all into secular terms, science allows us to improve upon the world, to heal disease, to reduce suffering, and I do not need to belabor the point that we are all the recipients of the largesse of science, medicine, comfortable homes, and so much else. I, for one, am happy that someone invented the telegraph. So, but just because something can be done does not mean it should be done. Science must be in the service of human values, and most science is, for good or bad, dual use. It could be either used for good or for bad. So the challenge is always to identify that part in the middle and to find the right balance. The tension most definitively exists in modern biology and genetics, and I've spent most of my career on uh, studies of genetics. So to give you one example, this, this new genetic modification technology could be used to modify biological life forms that have existed largely independent of humans for a long time. Plants, mosquitoes, mice. There's a long history of obviously modifying the genetics of plants and animals through selective breeding. But now we can do it much more precisely through genetic modification. What can that do? So this is golden rice, genetically modified to have it contain vitamin A to be used in an area where that is not really in people's diets. But vitamin A deficiency is estimated to kill over 600,000 children per year. Modern genetic science is being used to reduce all of that suffering. So if Samuel Morse was around today, he would proclaim, what hath God wrought? Luckily, Omar set the stage, so I will not last long here on the most dangerous animal on the planet. And as he pointed out, this, is result, this animal results in all sorts of death and suffering each year. And again, we can use modern genetic technology to relieve that suffering in the world. But let us look at the other end of the continuum. We're modifying nature to fit human desire. We are synthesizing life. Yes, of course, we humans have always modified nature. We humans are part of nature. Uh, but should there be any limit on human intervention? Do we want to live in a world where every life form has been modified to fit human desire? Do you want to live in what philosophers call the synthetic age? This is an example that's often used. These are baby rabbits. Two of them have been genetically modified so that they glow. So, you know, maybe there's a good reason for this. Um, but in general, do we want to have any limits? Do we want to have every last life form constructed to fit human need? Do people want to believe in what people would sort of call, you know, nature? Much of my career has been spent writing about the ethics of human gene editing, is what it would be called now. Almost 50 years ago, UC San Diego's Ted Friedman was one of the original researchers in this. And today, it has actually not worked. Now, with the invention of CRISPR, it finally looks like the suffering of people with diseases like sickle cell anemia will finally be relieved. It would be through a particular version of this where you would change the genes of an existing person in a way that relieves their condition but is not transmitted to their children, okay? called somatic cell uh, gene therapy. The consensus has been since the 1970s, if you could actually get this to work, we would simply call this medicine. 
unambiguous good. How about trying to design an improved human species through germline modification? Some advocates would say they want to create a humanity 2.0 to replace the flawed 1.0 that all of us are residing in right now. Okay? We could change the, gene, the genes in a person and their children, their children's children, and in a very small way, cumulatively, the human species. This has largely been rejected. It's illegal throughout all of Western Europe. Conservatives have rejected it historically because they believe it would result in the objectification of humans because they would be designed, reflected in the 1950s uh, or 1940s novel Brave New World by Aldous Huxley. More contemporary concern, also found by uh, political liberals, is that this would result in a genetically structured form of, of um, uh, social stratification where your inequality is essentially written into your genes. Between, you have a society split between the genetic haves and the genetic haves not. This is reflected in the 1997 movie Gaddock, which I recommend to you. But as we see, we have to be sort of forever vigilant to make sure that genetics is being used to forward the good and avoid the bad. We have to figure out this messy space in between, between the two extremes. So as Kit mentioned, I'm proud of the fact that UC San Diego has supported the creation of an institute that I co-founded with philosopher Craig Callender called the Institute for Practical Ethics. We try at best to describe the choices in the messy middle. And we are a unique mix of social scientists, philosophers, historians, scientists, each contributing our little piece to hopefully make a much better whole. And I would say the division of biological sciences have been our most important partner. As mentioned, we are supported by TIGS to create an independent debate that nonetheless interacts with people in the labs. We have about 13 people in our working group who are involved with our gene drive uh, working group, and many of them come to the lab meetings that are held monthly. And the, many of the scientists from these meetings come to our meetings. We have an educational component for the postdocs who works in the labs, and uh, we continue with an annual conference that involves people from all of the groups. We ask many important questions, one of which was already asked. But a sociologist might ask, what do people in areas of high malarial rates actually think about modifying mosquitoes that cannot transmit malaria? I have a postdoc, a socio sociology postdoc, heading to the field next week to investigate that very question. A philosopher might ask, what is the concern we would have about risk in a situation like this? Should we be using risk-benefit analysis? Should we use the precautionary principle? How should we even consider risk? And a political philosopher might ask, uh, and I, we actually have hired a postdoc who specializes in, in this question, who should decide whether or not you release a mosquito like this? Because it is, you know, the mosquitoes do not recognize national boundaries very well. Uh, so who would decide? The town, the nation, the entire world, how would that work? And more importantly, in our communication with the people who actually know this technology, recognizing a problem, you could do something like avoid the problem by self-limiting gene drives of some sort. So modern biology has resulted in incredible improvements in the human condition. But modern biology could also have dehumanizing or destructive effects. It's through the examination of the social implications and ethics of this technology that we can stay on the side of progress, as represented here on campus by Morse's uh, first telegraph message. So uh, thank you for your attention. I'll take any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That, was, that was great. Can you please tell us uh, why ethical considerations are so important in today's gene editing revolution? The main difference is the incredible transformation in power and what's possible. 100 years ago, if you, wanted to, if you wanted to influence the genetic outcome of your children, you could say, well, that person's kind of tall. Maybe I'll mate with that person. Okay? <laughs> and that was not a very precise way to go about doing things. Okay? Now you have this incredible precision. Uh, there's a 
historian writing right after the realization that the eugenic laws of the 1920s and 30s in Germany had ultimately led to the Holocaust, who says something like, uh, the one thing that has stopped humanity's terrible designs has been our inability to achieve them. So if you actually have the power in your hands to do these sorts of things, you unfortunately have an additional responsibility to avoid the bad. Thank you. It's a sobering answer. Are there questions from the audience? Are there any beneficial effects of malaria causing mosquitoes? Well, uh, there's, um, so I don't know if there's any beneficial effect. That would be something I'll turn to my scientific colleagues, which I often do. I was actually tripped up for a second, which is um, uh, when people talk in my research on human genetics, people often talk about the advantage of being a carrier for sickle cell anemia, uh, which is, Sickle cell anemia is only bad for you if you have two copies of the gene and you don't live in sub-Saharan Africa. But if you're a carrier and you live in sub-Saharan Africa, it's actually, quote unquote, good for you because it gives you some degree of, of resistance against uh, malaria. But the, the core of your question, I'll do what I always do at the Institute for Practical Ethics, is when I get to a very scientific question, I'll say, ask Omar. <laughs> Another question? Do you want to answer? Yeah. What's So, um, oh, that's really loud. Uh, I get asked that question a lot, and um, should I give them the answer? That we, <laughs> so, we, we did a practice run of this, and, and that, that question came up, and um, I, I, I gave a talk at um, Point Loma Nazarene, which, which was last year. It was a really great, uh, you know, great audience there, um, and they asked that question. And so I couldn't think of a good answer. But so what I what I did say was, I realized that human human population is, you know, some people would argue that there's too many humans on Earth already. Um, and so one thing that mosquitoes can do is control the population, right? So I gave that answer, and they and they did not like that answer. <laughs> <laughs> but but yeah, the, the truth is is that it's really hard to find something. I mean. The, the what, what you know the the answer he, that he gave was was really good. I mean that's one one example, but it's really hard to find uh, you know a good use for mosquitoes. You know um, they are they they are a food source for aquatic insects. So and 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 there are there is evidence that bats consume uh, mosquitoes. So if you if you removed all mosquitoes from Earth and there's like over three thousand species, there would be a significant impact. But the the work we're doing is is really to focus on. You know, five or six species that transmit um, for dengue, Zika, chikungunya, yellow fever. It's only two species. If we get rid of those two species, Aegypti and Albopictus, those viruses are gone. You know, so I don't think removing those two species is going to have a significant impact, especially since they're they're invasive. Um, Aegypti, you know, came to California in um, 2013, and it's all all throughout California now. So if you removed it right now, I mean. That's not very much time. I, I don't think there would be any impact. So I think that's the real, the real heart of the question there. All right, thank you. Other questions for John? Yes. Uh, you ask all the right questions in, the, um, in your presentation. Have you come to any conclusions, any guiding principles uh, yeah. from your discussions? Yeah, so I mean, a couple of clarifications, as we say, is that there's in the United States and most of the Western world, there's something you would call regulatory ethics that is forced to come to actual conclusions. Uh, you might be familiar with this with your doctor's office. That you sign an informed consent form as a form of regulatory ethics. We've just restricted ourselves to what I would call like academic versions of this, where we, we're a bunch of you know, academics, and so we're all going to come up with our own ideas, et cetera. We all certainly have our own conclusions about this. But as an organization, we aren't going to come to sort of a collective conclusion. That said, I think if you pulled everyone into the room who knows anything about the ethics and social implications of this, and you came up with every ethical solution, all 100 of them, put them on the floor, the conclusion would be there's only 25 of these that are reasonable. And the one thing we can do is to say that these 75 are really unreasonable, would be very supported by very few people. I will simply add there's an additional challenge in Western liberal de democratic societies, which is there is spectacular value pluralism in the country, 
And in a liberal democratic society, the state is not supposed to have a theory of the good. Okay? It's not supposed to have a value that it supports for everyone. And so how do you come up with a collective ethics in that sort of environment? And the answer is, it's extremely difficult. Um, so uh, yes, uh, we have come to some basic ones. I would say that Omar's impulse to say, is it better to be more cautious and have these things uh, peter out after a certain time? I think most people would say that caution is better than lack of caution. Um, but it is a tricky question, yes. Thank you. That's great. Other questions? I'm probably just not speaking into it. There we go. Do organisms like terrible mosquitoes, do they have a right to exist as a species? And I mean, I right. think jerboas obviously have a right to exist. They're adorable. <laughs> but, you know, where do we, where do we get to decide? Like, and I, I think that's who gets to decide. Question's very important, but yeah. how does that discussion happen? Well, I mean, so that's essentially, I don't think there will ever be a discussion like that that would actually have teeth because that's an international problem. There's no international governance, essentially, in the world. Um, and so the question of whether or not all organisms have a right to continued existence, I don't think I'd be willing to endorse that, uh, given that how many organisms become extinct every day just because of, you know, whatever. Um, but you're pointing to one of the real challenges is that, you know, people really think chimpanzees have a lot of what philosophers would call moral status. And these amoebas don't have as much. Okay? And so somewhere between that continuum, people tend to draw a line. Okay? Where are you going to draw that line? Okay, well, here you're running into the sort of value diversity uh, in, in America. So most people, and here I'll put my sociology hat on, most people would say that uh, it's better it, to save human lives, they would endanger or even kill animals. I did an empirical study once. And I, one of the questions was, would you kill a chimpanzee if necessary to create a cure for a human who was otherwise going to die? And of the 120 interviewees, all but one said that they, they would. They said, I, of course, like to save the chimpanzees. I like chimpanzees. But if you absolutely had to choose, they would do that. So people draw the line somewhere, and there really isn't a consensus. There's various theories we could tell you about what it means to have moral status, consciousness, et cetera, et cetera. You are pointing to one of the great problems in what's called environmental ethics. OK, that was a great question. So I'd like to invite the remaining the speakers up again for a short panel discussion. Okay. Thank you very yeah. much. That was excellent. So. Stand in front of the beacon. Okay. All right. Yeah, beacon. Go to the beacon. Okay, so um, I'd like to sort of launch this. So I'll ask a question or two, and then I'll turn it over to the audience for questions for the whole group or for individuals in the, in the panel. And I'd like to just invite my speakers to say something about what what they think the future looks like in their field and or what excites them about the future. All right, Kit. Well, uh, obviously with hybrid vigor, we're working directly on plants at this time. But we'd like to extend this to humans. I'm personally getting to the age where a cup of coffee with some hybrid vigor in it would be a great way to start the day. <laughs> and there's every reason to hope we'll be able to do that. We all have the same mechanisms. It's a universal phenomenon. And seeing this play out uh, in interventions for human health is one of the things that excites me. That's great. Thank you. Yeah, great question. Um, I think in, in the field of, of genetic control of insects and gene drive, I think in the t 10 years from now, we will, we will probably see some sort of field trial of, of some kind. Um, I don't know what, what kind that will be, but I think uh, from, from our work, I think we'll, we'll, we'll be hoping to go to the field with some sterile insects and, and maybe some self-limiting type gene drives. Um, we're going to try. No guarantee that that's going to be accepted by the public or the regulators or I, that's out of my control, but we're going to try. Um, and 
I know there are other groups that are trying also, and so 10 years is a long time. I think we will see something. That's, that's my, my guess. Thank you, that's great. Hannah. So I've got a two-part answer. One is about evolution, which is something that I'm interested in. Um, a lot of people are comparing very different species to one another in order to understand evolution and also understand structures that are the same in absolutely all species, right? And I'm really excited. I think that some of the techniques that we've talked about today are going to be more and more applicable in more different species. And eventually I will be able to, you know, use the Draboa to directly investigate how you make a limb and how long it is. On the medical side, I think that, um, I don't know if you all know this, this was shocking to me, but primates are more closely related to rodents than they are to cats, dogs, cows, and like anything you can mention. So the important thing there is that actually mouse models of human disease are really essential. And a lot of people are working on making mice that have the same immune system as humans so that clinical trials for human drugs and things like that will actually be more applicable and will really be able to be a consistent predictor of, of medicine in humans. Uh, in my field, uh, it's a little bit different, but I think what I'm look I like in the future is that there's an increasing concern of what the public thinks about such matters. I think the history of this has not been good for science. Science is the best method that we humans have come up for improving the human condition, but there's not been support for activity primarily because there's been a conflict, essentially of a perceived moral conflict between scientists and other communities. So I could show you that any conflict between religion and science historically since the 1950s has been about morals, not about facts, about nature. So what's happened in my field is that scientists used to sort of hoard control over the ethics of this. So if you look at this Silmar conference in 1973, only scientists were allowed to even be in the room. You get to the 1990s, there was an it, 80s, there was a profession invented called bioethics. It was supposed to be sort of a mediator. And now there's a move towards saying, what does the public actually think? Maybe we should engage in public engagement to see what the public thinks. And I think that this has the potential benefit of, of increasing trust in science and increasing our ability to solve uh, the great challenges left that are in the physical world. Thank you. That was great. Are there additional questions from the audience for our panelists? Yeah, how do you control these things, these scientific techniques, once they become cheap and pervasive? Which is looks like it's happening right now. I mean, you can buy a CRISPR machine for a buck ninety-eight on Amazon, or soon we'll be able to. That's an outstanding question. Who does somebody want to tackle that one? one version, which is. Yeah, good question. Uh, however, I was at one wrinkle, which is that a lot of people are concerned about human applications of this thing. And for those of you who are concerned by people in their garage modifying the human species, you'll be happy to know uh, that it still requires an actual hospital, an actual doctor, and people who have actual regulations to do. Recognizing what happened in China, the, the medical system there was a bit pliant. Uh, but when it comes to plants and animals and the like, I will leave it to my colleagues. It does sound a little easy to do. So when you can solve that problem. Um, so I don't know if you've, if you've watched the Netflix documentary. It's called Unnatural Selection. Um, it's available on Netflix right now. But there's, I think there's four or five episodes in there. And the majority of the whole series is about biohackers. And there, there's a couple guys in there that you know, are, are using CRISPR, like you say. Um, and they're not, they're not in a lab, they're doing it out of their garage. And they're trying to build, you know, uh, you know guide RNAs that, that can be used for HIV and other, other things. And they're injecting themselves already. So this is already happening. And you could watch that Netflix series that talks all about it. Um, I think in terms of controlling it from happening, I think you need to, you need regulation. You need regulators to come in and, and, and you know, stop selling it to the public, only sell it, sell it for, you know, the reagents for research purposes and so forth. That might work, I don't know, but it's, it's already happened, I think. I would just like to add that it's also not actually as easy as we've made it seem up here. Um, 
that there's a reason that all of these different scientists study these things and work for years and years on them. It is not trivial to make a mouse that has even one gene changed. It's a non-trivial pursuit. So um, in terms of these things being widely available for use, I think it's still not going to have, at least in the short term, a big impact on whether there's going to be magic gerbouses released into the universe. There should be. <laughs> Thank you. That's great. Other questions? Thank you. Actually, I have a follow-up question related to the previous question. Uh, once you develop, for example, the gene drive system in mosquitoes and optimize it for that species, the knowledge that you gain there, how transferable or how easily transferable it is to mammals? Because larger ethical questions loom on what New Zealand wants to do with these or what China wants to do with these. And are there aspects of the technology which either don't transfer or are accessible only to you in a manner that you can work with regulators to choose to share or not? Okay, that's great. Who wants this one? Can I start? Yeah. Okay. Sorry, this is like literally what my thesis will be about is about the fact that we took this incredible system that had worked really well in flies and mosquitoes. And we slapped it in mice, and we were like, it's going to work great. And then two years later, I was like, it works OK. <laughs> um, realistically, flies and mosquitoes actually have a very unusual principle, which is that in all of their cells, their homologous chromosomes, the two copies of each chromosome, are actually lined up with one another all the time. And that makes it very easy to transfer between them. That's true in almost no other animal. Okay, So in virtually every other animal, the only way to do this is to restrict it to the process of producing sperm and eggs, which is the only time in your body when those chromosomes are lined up. So it is actually less transferable than I would have thought. But um, between fly species, between mosquito species, I would guess that it's almost all the same. Yeah, so, so there's, a, there's a, a gene drive consists of a few different components, right? Um, the Cas9 is going to be similar. The guide RNA structure is going to be similar. You have to design it to your gene of interest and your species of interest. And then you have to express the Cas9 and the guide RNA in your species of interest. So you need regulatory machinery to do that from your species. And then you also have to have the ability to genetically modify your species. So those are all significant limitations in terms of, and, and part of the reason it took Hannah two years to get this to work was because those, those regulatory pieces were not defined. She didn't know what promoter to drive Cas9 with. She didn't know what promoter to drive the guide RNA with. So she had to test many different um, iterations until one combination actually was successful. So it's not, it isn't as easy as, as, as it seems. And I think you do need, you need to have these um, abilities to do these different processes in, in order for this to work. So that's my answer. So this is a classic ethical problem, which is, this is like, an empirical slippery slope theory. Everyone familiar with the slippery slope? You start at the top on something that's morally perfectly, everyone agrees is great, stopping children in sub-Saharan Africa from dying from malaria. Okay. The knowledge you obtain from doing that and the transformation of people's cultural attitudes towards things like gene drive changes the odds of someone taking the next step, a few steps down the slope. And then that changes the odds of taking the next step, the next step, the next step. So, how do we stop this slide to whatever the bottom is to find your bottom, okay, the sort of you know, dystopian whatever it is, and the one people, thing people often say is, well, we're going to have a barrier on the wall. It's called scientific reality. Okay? Science will never allow us to uh, use CRISPR to modify 300 human genes at once or whatever, uh, and that will be our barrier. And to that, I'll simply say it's usually a loser move to bet against science. And so I think, you know, you kind of got to swim. What would I do when it becomes possible? And that's what people should be thinking of. Great. Thank you. Are there other questions from the audience? One more over here. Okay. Uh, does CRISPR as a gene editing tool have any, like, major drawbacks or weaknesses compared to, to other gene editing tools that we have already used in the past? That's a good question. Who wants to take that? <laughs> Do you want to answer it first? <laughs> yeah, so that's a really great question. Um, I mean, 
you know, CRISPR is, is a revolution, right? It's a huge leap forward from all the previous technologies like zinc finger nucleases or tailins. Those things were difficult to engineer, whereas CRISPR is straightforward. You can design a guide RNA and order, have it in your lab the next day. So it's, it's pretty efficient in that regard, but in terms of limitations, the, the, the nuclease is, is not perfect. I mean, it does make double-stranded breaks and it can also make nicks, but it also makes off-target off targets. So sometimes it targets genes it's not supposed to target, right? So if you're gonna modify your cells, somatic cells, you don't wanna target something else, right? So that's a huge limitation. And then also with, with human therapies, um, the delivery is also a limitation. How are you gonna deliver it to the right place at the right time? If you wanna target a cancer, uh, you know, uh, some, if you have cancerous cells and you want to target those specifically, how are you going to do that, right? So those are the things that people are working on now, um, ways, methods of delivery, methods of specificity, and there's a whole, you know, I would say a, a new revolution with CRISPR, which is called base editing, where they're actually modifying the CRISPR nuclease to just really specifically edit a single base, but it's still not perfect, right? So how perfect does it need to be in order to go forward with, you know, Human, human therapies, um, that's, that's I, mean, I don't know the answer to that, but there are CRISPR therapies that are in clinical trials right now to see how efficient and effective and, and how much off-targeting there is, right? And um, so that's kind of uh, where the field is heading now. Excellent, thank you. Okay, so I would like to invite the audience to join us outside with the speakers in a little reception that we'll have. So thank me, uh, join me in thanking our speakers once again for a night. Nice <laughs> and, and before we go, I would just like to also thank the many individuals and institutions that funded the research. Um, research such as this takes an army and it also takes a village, it takes the collective action. So we're funded not only by the um, National Institute of Health and DARPA, and the National Science Foundation, but also by an array of foundations and private philanthropy. And we're really grateful to this support because it allows us to take a really unique interdisciplinary approach to this problem and make sure that we're developing new tools. As we heard, the technology is advancing at such a rapid rate. We really need this partnership with our colleagues in the arts and humanities and social sciences to make sure that we're doing this in the right manner. So thank you once again to everyone who joined us here tonight, and I look forward to talking to you outside at our reception. Thank you. Thank you.